Good morning, church. Good to see you again this morning. We're going to be in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, Colossians chapter 2. And uh, just various portions out of there, but we'll probably begin somewhere around verse 8, Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 8. While you're trying to find that, last time I was here, I took the opportunity to embarrass someone in public, and I'm going to do that again this morning. I've got a good friend who's here for the first time, and Billy Ray, won't you just stand up right where you are? Everyone, that's Billy Ray, introducing you to a new friend of mine. We've started studying the Bible together, and uh, he's just real keen to learn and grow in the Lord and, and to study the Scriptures, so good on you for coming, Billy Ray. This is your first, first time at church this morning, right? So praise the Lord, we're glad to have you with us. Welcome in a special way. Right, so Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, and it reads like this. starts with a warning. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Profound, uh, a profound little concept here. You know, whenever you see the word beware, whether it's, if, especially if it's on someone's gate and it's got a picture of a dog on it, it means that you don't just walk into this property blindly and unexpectedly, right? You, you rattle the gate, you rattle the fence, you see if the dog comes running, because if you walk into this territory without being cautious, you're likely to sustain significant injury, right? And so when you see the word beware, it's a significant warning. In this case, it's a warning about philosophy. It's a warning about error. It's a warning about deception. It's the wake-up call that says you can't believe just anything that you come across in this world. You can't believe it just because your mother taught it to you, because your father taught it to you, because someone you deeply respect who's a good friend taught it to you. You can't believe it just because some guy stands up in front of a church like I'm doing this morning and says this is the way it is. Paul issues a significant warning. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. And then he classifies what he means by that. According to the tradition of men, and it is divorced from from our understanding and the teachings of Scripture on who and what Christ is. I want to suggest to you something this morning. The greatest danger that you and I as members of God's body on earth is church face. The greatest danger that the church as a whole faces is not sexual immorality or the great and obvious breaking of God's Ten Commandments out there in the world. Those things are so obvious and so in your face that we're very much aware of them. Perhaps the greatest danger that you and I, that the church faces, that that Paul is trying to capture here in these words of warning, is the subtle alterations and changes to the gospel. Not the big sins out there, not the, not, not the marquee sins that everyone is aware of, that everyone stares in the face every day. Yes, that has the risk of desensitizing you, but within the church of God is writing to this group in, Col- in the city of Colossae, this, the Colossian believers, and he says, I want you to be careful of something. And he doesn't list the Ten Commandments. He doesn't warn of the rampant immorality of the, of the pagan society around them. He says, I want you to beware of something far more subtle. I want you to be aware of teachers and people coming in and and, and and looking as if they are believers, part of the family of God, and subtly altering and changing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beware lest anyone cheat you, lest they rob you through philosophy, good sounding logic, and empty deceit, nice sounding words that detract from the centrality and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And I want to suggest that nothing's changed in the 21st century. If you look at the, the, the rise and the fall and the rise and the fall of Christianity down through the ages, you will find that this is where the struggle is. The struggle is maintaining the purity and the centrality of the gospel. In the 21st century, as you and I prepare for the coming of Jesus, you and I face the same subtle risks that somehow we would reduce the gospel. Not that, we would, not that we would take something that's completely erroneous and bring it in. Sure, that has happened in history. But that's not the primary focus of Paul here. His primary focus is that you and I would somehow come to blend the gospel with some concept of humanity, some concept of philosophy that sounds great, but undermines the centrality, the purpose, the meaning of Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
I want to suggest a few ways in which this happens within the church this morning. And I want you to examine your life. I want you to consider within yourself whether somehow it's not that you have forsaken the gospel overtly. It's not somehow that you have turned your back on Jesus Christ. But just somehow the beauty and the richness and the fullness of what the gospel is has been reduced so that the gospel has become reductionistic in your thinking. It's reduced to something that's not wrong in and of itself, but, ha- but excludes the fullness of what the gospel is, excludes the centrality of Jesus Christ. Are you with me so far? What are the ways in which this happens in the church? The most obvious one that anyone's going to put up as uh, right up there is, is the idea of legalism. In fact, the book of Galatians tells us that legalism is not just a reducing of the gospel, it's an entirely different gospel. You're not saved by Jesus Christ, you're saved by your rule keeping. And many of those rules, by the way, are not even biblical rules, they're often rules we add, the rules that that, that we try and make sense of our religion with. They're often man-made additions to the gospel. This was the case in Paul's time. The Jewish believers were happy to accept Jesus Christ, but, 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 but Jesus wasn't all there was to their salvation. They needed to be born into the right heritage. They needed to be of the right family biologically. Salvation was inherited generationally. And then your obedience to the commandments of God and to the keeping of God's rules, that's what entitled you to salvation. And Jesus was somehow added onto that mix there somewhere. Is it important that we're obedient to God and to His commandments? Is it important that we obey Him? Is it important that we live up to the truth that He has instructed us? Of course it is. But that's not how you are saved. It's not the centrality of the gospel message. Legalism is not a gospel. It's not even a reduction of the gospel. It's a completely different gospel. It's a removing of Christ from the center. Jesus is no longer my Savior. What I do and how I perform, whether I measure up and how closely I measure up to whatever the standard is that we have created as a community of faith, That determines whether I will be saved, whether my destiny for all of eternity is secure. Or maybe we've fallen into the trap of formalism. Formalism is the idea that the gospel is reduced to the programs and the ministries of the church. As long as you participate in church services, as long as you participate in some small group, as long as you participate in some ministry and some form of outreach, as long as you attend the meetings and as long as you're, you're there and you're part of the discussion, that somehow that's what the gospel is. The gospel is my living up to the agendas and the meetings and the programs of the church. These things are supposed to be the forums in which we present Jesus Christ. They are not the self, our salvation in and of ourselves. We get to maintain our own, our, we get to choose what we participate in. We get to clear our own agendas and make up our own agendas in this idea. But, but we are still in control. And my salvation is simply left up to my participation in the community of faith and its programs. The church will never save you. You cannot enter into the experience of salvation simply by belonging to a church or a denomination or a club. You can never enter into salvation just by being busy with the Lord's work. That is not how you are saved. And I would suggest to you that formalism is one of the greatest reductions of the gospel. It reduces the gospel to mere participation in the programs and the ministries of the church. Is your Christianity more filled with busyness than with Jesus? What about mysticism? Mysticism, there's a strange word. What is mysticism? Mysticism reduces the gospel to ecstatic highs and extraordinary spiritual experiences. It's the working up of emotion, the substituting of emotional high for connection with Jesus Christ, for relationship with Jesus Christ. It's easy to get a a band up front and and to, through the use of music, to build up emotion and feeling. It's easy for us to come to think that Christian maturity and growth is about always being in a happy place. 
But what about the fact that life often leaves us in a place where, it is, where there is no happiness? What about the fact that, that brokenness is a part of life? And that emotions come and emotions go. And, if, and, and, and in mysticism, we reduce our relational connectedness to Jesus and our idea of Christian growth to some sort of emotional experience. And when I'm not having that emotional experience, it must be because Jesus has forsaken me. It must be because my faith is too weak. It doesn't take into account that God is often working in the midst of our lowest of the low moments of time and that we are as much connected with Jesus Christ and as much in the experience of worship and as much surrendered in this relational experience with Jesus in the bad as in the good. Now, is it true that when we worship God, there is a rightful place for emotion? Yes or no? We're not preaching against emotion. We're preaching against the reduction of the gospel from the centrality of Jesus Christ and being in relationship to him to mere emotional high. Does this make sense to you? So that I judge the authenticity and the depth of my Christian experience, not on my communion with God, not on the centrality of Jesus as my Savior, but whether I am feeling something. Big danger big danger. What about activism? Activism, you know, busyness. Activism reduces the gospel to defending what is right. Is it true that the gospel and the teachings of the Bible reveal truth and error? Yes or no? Of course it does, right? Are we called as Christians to stand for what is true? Yes or no? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. But if you reduce your Christian experience to mere activism, to fighting the cause of justice in the world, if your Christian experience is not about communion with Jesus at the center of it, but your Christian experience is built around defending what is right and protecting the church from the evils of culture, if you're all about worrying and panicking and and protesting down the main street of Auckland City against abortion and all the rest of it, I'm not saying there's a problem with that. I'm saying if that's what your Christianity is reduced to, you're not in communion with Jesus Christ, but your obsession in life is merely about flying the flag of truth, standing up when no one else is speaking out. If that's what your Christianity is reduced to, and you think that's what being a Christian is, standing up, speaking out, then you've missed the centrality of the gospel. Jesus is all about truth. But the truth is in him as a person. The gospel is about so much more than rightness. It's about Jesus' person. Does this make sense to you? Reductionistic again. How else do we reduce the gospel? Do we fall into the trap of biblicism? And ask yourself if this is not a particular trap that we as Seventh-day Adventists can fall into. Biblicism, the idea that, that, that Christianity is reduced to mere mastery of theological concepts. You know, the memorization of the right words, the explanation of grand theological topics, the ability to argue your point and come out victorious. Biblicism. Is the Bible about giving us correct theology? Is the Bible about the revelation of God and the character of God? Does the Bible reveal to us true and correct doctrine? Of course it does. Nothing wrong with that. But when you've lost communion with Jesus Christ and your Christian experience is built around knowing truth so that no one can argue with you and get away with it, so you can quote every verse in just the right place, when you have reduced your Christian experience to the mere mastery of theological concepts, you have fallen for a reduced gospel? Should we know who God is? Of course we should. Should we be able to give a reason for our faith? Of course we should. Should we be able to speak that truth in love to others? Of course we should. Is it just about winning an argument? No, never. It's about winning hearts and souls to the Savior. Do we reduce our Christianity to mere mastery of theological subjects. You know, if I can just understand everything about righteousness and perfection, if I can just understand everything about the, about the character and the nature of Jesus Christ, if I can just understand the concept of the Trinity, if I could just get my head around that and be able to explain it fluently, then I must be a Christian. I must be in the experience of salvation because I know so much about God. Is biblicism a form of Christian Gnosticism? 
The idea that our salvation is received through degrees of knowledge ascending to the higher realms. There is a risk that we can reduce the gospel. What about, here's an interesting word for you, psychologyism. You probably won't find that in the dictionary. Psychologyism. The reduction of the Christian gospel and message to make Jesus Christ more your therapist than your savior. The idea that Jesus is all about fulfilling your unfulfilled needs. You know, my, my financial needs. You know, my, my, my emotional needs. You know, my, my loneliness needs. My, my need for healing. Jesus is all about my healing. That's what I need to pursue Jesus for. Question, is Jesus interested in healing you? Of course he is. The gospel is replete with examples of that, including resurrection from the dead. Jesus wants your healing. But when all Jesus is to you is not your Savior, saving you from indwelling sin, from a problem that resides deep within you, but is merely trying to fix the superficial. When you pursue Jesus for this upper level of what you think your needs are, those are not your primary needs. Your primary need is rooted in the fact that you are fallen, that you are corrupt, that to the core of your being, sin has tainted and polluted you, that you are created to be a covenant-keeping, relational being in connection with God, but that you and I have substituted connection with God for all sorts of other things. We've substituted for human relationships that we value more than Jesus Christ. We are idolaters at heart. We, we have chosen things and possessions over God. We live for money and power. We're, we're, we're obsessed with, with seeking our pleasure and with finding refuge in things that are not God. We are covenant breakers at, our, at the depth of our heart. We are relationally distorted at the core of our being. And when you're pursuing Jesus Christ simply for your need of healing, psychologically, emotionally, physically, or any other type of healing, that is a secondary concern. That is a secondary blessing. You can pursue Jesus for those things and still not have surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ. You see Jesus as your Savior. You see Jesus as someone who's going to be there in your loneliest hour, as, as someone who has the power to heal you physically. No problem with that. But when that's all Jesus is to you, and you are not given over to him, you are not in communion with him, talking, walking, living for him, with him, through him, when you're not confessing, giving him your heart, the brokenness and the corruption, when it's more about other people's sins against you, because you know that our unfulfilled needs, the things we call our unmet needs, are all about the way people sin against us. You see, I'm lonely because people don't befriend me. They neglect me. I, they are sinning against me. I am messed up psychologically and sexually. Why? Not because I was born that way, but because my father or my mother abused me. I, I have unmet needs because society isn't doing its part in carrying me. Uh, whatever, whatever it is, your perceived unmet needs that upper layer of needs, not your true heart condition, is all about the ways in which people sin against you and leave you feeling empty. Well, I'm going to find a, a Jesus who will somehow meet the needs that other people have failed to meet in my life. They have sinned against me. No, no. You have sin within you. Your problem is not just that people have sinned against you. Jesus is not just there to substitute and make up for the many ways in which people have sinned against you. Jesus is there to deal with the problem of sin that indwells you. Do you see the difference? At the core of our being, we have broken covenant with God. We have broken relationship with God. We've turned our back on God. At the core of our, of our very being is a heart disorientation. We are idolaters. We don't just have problems and needs. We are the problem at the core of our being. You don't just need a therapist you need a savior. You don't just need someone whose shoulder you can cry on in prayer. You need someone you can surrender to. And it can deal with the core problem of your being. 
What about socialism? I'm not talking about the economic policy or the political policy of socialism. I'm talking about the reduction of the gospel to a network of good friendships in the church. Is it true that the church of God is called the body of Christ? Yes. Is it true that the body of Christ is made up of brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes, right? Is it true that you and I should be growing in relationship with one another? Yes or no? Yes. Is there a rightful place for healthy human relationships in the gospel? Yes, of course there is. Because it's in the context of relationships that this thing called sanctification happens. What is sanctification? Fancy word. You're growing up into maturity in Jesus Christ. You're coming to reflect, reflect Christ-likeness happens through community. You will never be Christ-like. You will never be God-like in character if you withdraw from the community of faith. If you think that you can, you can get, you know, have a guts full of the community of faith because of the ways in which they mess with you and fail you and, and just get away from them, I'm just going to go and be a Christian in my little corner, you have failed Christ-likeness. You have failed to lay down your life for the brethren who have failed you. You have failed to wash their feet like Jesus washed the feet of his betraying disciple Judas. The night of his betrayal, he washed the feet of Judas. It is in the context of healthful Christian relationships and unhealthful Christian relationships. This dynamic we call the body of Christ, the church, it's in this context that the gospel happens. It's in this context that you are challenged, that your need for Jesus Christ is awoken. Why? Because it's in that context of living in amongst people that the selfishness of your corrupt heart is revealed. That moment when you're saying, I have had enough of these people, I am out of there. That is the moment that calls you to repentance. That is the moment that calls you to, to call upon your Savior. Because in that moment, you are tempted with self over service. You are tempted with living for your own agenda and your own comfort rather than living for God's agenda of surrender and service. In that very moment, in that moment you hate in the community of faith where you wonder why you do this every week. In that moment is a revelation of your biggest need, your need for a savior. When you reduce the Christian experience, the gospel message to, to a Christian socialism, a network. The, the gospel is all about providing for me a new family in Christ. The gospel is all about providing for me new friendship networks in Christ, and new business opportunities in the body of Christ. When the gospel is reduced to that, you're not in a saving relationship with Jesus. You've missed the centrality of the Savior. Maybe in your own mind, there's other ways in which you have reduced the gospel. When we say reduced, we're again, we're saying we've taken one element of truth and we've exalted it to be the end all of the gospel to the exclusion of other elements. It's not that that element is wrong. It's that the exclusion of the fullness of all the other elements that make up the gospel, the exclusion of Jesus Christ at the center, the exclusion of the fact that I am supposed to be in a worship-driven relationship with Jesus Christ. That has been neglected. And I'm not calling on Jesus. I'm not in relationship with Jesus. I'm just in association with believers. I'm just somehow floating with the community of faith. I'm just somehow busy with the activities of the community of faith. I'm somehow just busy with the book and the scripture and the content of the community of faith and of the Bible. I'm just busy, with, I'm just busy trying to earn and perform my way into heaven. Whatever it is for you, I challenge you this morning. To put Jesus Christ back on the throne of your life. To make your Christian experience truly about communion and worship with God. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men. According to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. And here comes this powerful, powerful verse. Are you ready for this? 
for in him. Why? Why should you beware of these reductionistic philosophical substitutes for the gospel? Why is it so important that you pay attention to to, to the fullness of the gospel? Notice what he's going to say. For, that means because. When you've been cheated, you miss out on this, this thing. For in him, in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and of all power. He says, when you have Jesus Christ at the center of your life, when you are, when you are in this experience of, of, of communion, that means relationship building, that means spending time in his presence, learning of him, learning through him, the, 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 the vulnerability of open-hearted prayer, holding nothing back, not trying to make out that you're something you're not, but just realizing that God's eye sees it all and speaking to him openly, confessing, getting real with him. When you enter into that experience with Jesus Christ, it's, it, it's, it pictures this as here is you, here is Jesus. In this state, you are filled with all sorts of rubbish on the inside. You're trying to make it happen for yourself. But when you enter into relationship with him, you in the eyes of God, you and Jesus Christ become so merged that all God sees is Jesus. Now, I know that to you, it's easy to separate that out because I, when I look at myself, I'm so unchristlike, I, I can't see any of Jesus there. But in the eyes of God, what God does is he gives himself to you. The gospel is this. Try, try and think of the gospel in these, in these words. The gospel is about identity. The gospel is about provision. And the gospel is about process. Did you get that? What three words? Identity. Provision, process. Identity, provision, process. Identity, provision, process. The gospel is about God giving himself to humanity. That's the provision. He gives himself in Jesus Christ. He doesn't just come to give you good things. He doesn't just come to give you the gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't just come to give you forgiveness. He doesn't just come to give you strength. He gives you himself. And in the context of himself, all these other things we usually fixate on as the gifts of the gospel, they come with the person of God. In Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. In Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. And it is in Jesus Christ walking amongst us, Jesus Christ ministering in our behalf, Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary above, that you today have all the gifts of God. When you're connected with Jesus Christ such that you are in him, in communion, in relationship, in surrender, in confession, that you are are in this place of just unreserved handing yourself over to him. No conditions, no strings attached, no little bits being held back. This in Christ idea means that you have every provision because everything that God is, is given to you. What could you possibly lack when you are in Christ, nothing. And it is in Christ, because of that provision, you are adopted and that gives you a new identity. You are not an addict. You are not an alcoholic. You are not a, 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 you know, a, a sex offender. In Christ, you have a new identity. We tend to define our identity by our failings or our successes. The things I do. I either fail or I succeed. I am an Olympic gold medalist. I am an athlete. I am an addict. I am a sex offender. I am an alcoholic. No, you are not. You are a child of God adopted through Jesus Christ into the very family of God. You are a child of God who struggles with addiction. You are a child of God who struggles with alcohol. You are a child of God who struggles with sexual purity. You are a child of God who struggles with pride. But those things are not your identity. And it's important to understand that because as long as your identity is your failing, you will stay in your failing. You have no greater direction to grow to than what I am. In Jesus Christ, you are adopted. Beautiful verse, 1 John 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. What? That we, that we should be called, that's identity, that we should be called the children 
of God, sons and daughters of God? How would it change your direction, your trajectory in life if you no longer identified yourself by your failings and your struggles, but you identified yourself by the truth that there is in the gospel, that you are a son and a daughter of God. You are a child of God. And though you have struggles, no struggle and no amount of failing changes the fact that because of what God has done in Jesus Christ, you are his son and daughter. It is unconditional. It is unconditional as long as you choose Jesus Christ and you choose to remain in communion with him. It is unconditional. It does not change by the fact that you have failed, by the fact that you need to afresh confess. You are in Christ. You are a son or a daughter of God. And being a son or a daughter of God, all provision is made for you in the gift of Jesus Christ. And that between the then of the past, the cross, and the then of the future, the coming of Jesus, in the here and now, God is involved with his sons and his daughters through the provision of Christ in the process of ongoing uh, change to godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is a God-honoring life. From the time you accept Jesus Christ to the time Jesus Christ comes in person to, to retrieve you from this earth. Godliness is God's goal for you. Not mere friendship. Not merely that you would have your psychological goals met or your needs perceived needs met, your hunger satisfied. God's agenda for your life is godliness. This is what the gospel is about. It's about your inner sin. Not just the externals of how others sin against you, but your inner sin. It's about surrendering the heart and the life and engaging in this process of change. It begins from from the moment you accept Jesus Christ. It culminates at the coming of Jesus. And at every step of the journey, Christ-likeness, godliness, God-honoring life is God's agenda for you. In the moments of high and in the moments of low. In fact, in fact, we could go so far as to say that the moments that are your lowest are the ones where God is most busy at work in your life. The ones where you are tempted to turn your back on God and say, you have forsaken me, are the ones where God is working his hardest. Why? Because it's in those low moments that Satan brings to you to destroy you that God is working for your surrender, that God is calling you to communion, that God is looking for you to trust him with every aspect of your being and every aspect of your circumstances. In the process of life, high and low, Salvation is being worked out in your life on a daily basis. This is what the gospel is about. It's about your new identity in Christ. It's about, your, about God's provision of himself, his own being in the person of Christ. And through the indwelling of Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, you and I today are in the process of change, headed on a trajectory toward heaven. Do you understand? Do you understand that you cannot reduce the gospel to anything other than Jesus Christ and communion with him. Do you understand that it's not about you being busy in the cause of God? It's not about you being perfect in the cause of God. It's not about you being it's not about you being in the right network of human relationships. It's not about you having your perceived needs met. It's about your heart coming into surrender, confession, communion with God. It's about the inner being being renewed through the living Jesus Christ. Do you understand that you need a Savior? Because your problem is within and it's so deeply rooted within you that you need someone from the outside who can get inside of you to change you. It's so deeply rooted inside that you cannot see clearly and you don't have the power to change your inner being. Do you understand that there is only one being in the entire universe who can do this? who can be God of the universe on the one hand and the God of your corrupt life on the other hand. Do you understand that salvation, salvation is about putting God back on the throne of your heart. 
about forsaking all the things that hijack your heart, your corrupt desires, the visions and the dreams that you substitute for his vision and dreams. Do you understand that what you need is a complete and a total internal overhaul? That it's not something that happens by just changing the externals of behavior or circumstances. It's the business of choice to give yourself to a God who has laid down his life for you. I ask you this morning, do you need a savior like Jesus Christ? What I'd like to do with you is pray. And if you're one of those people this morning who knows that you need a Savior, either because you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, or because you've been in Christian circles so long that you've fallen into the trap of reducing the gospel to one of those counterfeits we've mentioned. If you realize that you desperately need a Savior for the first time or again, you need to renew your covenant experience with God, then while we pray... In a moment of silence, all I want you to do is say, yes, Jesus, be my God, be my Savior. Take these idols out, trash them, get rid of them. I want my life to be oriented towards a worship-driven communion with you on a daily basis. You don't have to use those words. Use whatever words you want. Just give yourself to God by choice in the silence of your minds. And the God who reads and knows your thoughts will become your Savior. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning we ask you. We ask you to be something so much more than what we have often thought you wanted to be for us. This morning, Lord, we make confession of the ways in which perhaps in our struggle to understand the mystery and the beauty of the gospel, we somehow reduce it, not to something that's entirely wrong, but just to something that doesn't include the centrality of Jesus, and that somehow substitutes for the daily journey of communion and of fellowship, of conversation, of confession, of humility of heart, of, of chasing after your agendas and pursuing you with the joy of holiness. For ma making worship and the community of faith and spiritual things anything other than what it is supposed to be, Jesus, there are people in this room today who need a savior. There are people just like me. And I need you, Jesus, as my Savior. I need you to forgive me for the many, many ways in which I cheat on you with the things of this world, for the many ways in which, metaphorically speaking, I sleep with Satan, your enemy. I need you, Jesus, to, to just come into my life in such a way and make yourself so real to me to teach me to talk with you, to, to orient me in such a way that my heart goes out towards you naturally instead of towards other things and other people and other ways. And Jesus, I believe there are people here just like me who just need to take a moment to talk to you. And I pray that you would put it on their hearts what it is that they need to say to you in these few moments of silence. Father God, I thank you for the many good things you do for us. For the wide variety of gifts that you give us. But the one thing I thank you for above all else is that you have given yourself to us. Without holding back, 
you have given yourself to us in Jesus. Not for a period of time, but for all of eternity. And if there is one thing that I ask in behalf of this community of faith, Jesus, it's that you would teach us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the centrality of our faith, Jesus Christ. To keep our hearts deeply in love with the heart of God. That you would protect us from ourself and our tendencies to substitute many other good things for that sweet communion with you. We are a people easily distracted. We are a people, Jesus, who are so easily lured away by our own desires, our wants, our dreams, our aspirations, temptations. Where we fail to hold on to you, Jesus, I plead with you that you would hold on to us. Be our God, our Savior, our Father. Thank you for making us your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as we sing our song together. My faith has found a resting place.